So today's lecture is on uh, 2.3, basic differentiation formulas. Um, and this will be our last section before we get into, uh, before our first exam. So you'll want to review for that exam once we finish up with this. Uh, the lecture will occur right there. I also want to remind you um, that each of the modules does, because of the online course, that's where these come from, there's some pre-recorded videos. You're always welcome to take a look at those. Um, and some additional uh, examples. So they're always helpful um, and multiple ways of, of learning on things. So let's go ahead and get into our discussion of um, derivatives today. call this derivative the easy way. So we've been using this concept of limits. We've been developing it to show us that we can take uh, the average rate of change, which is a secant line, right, two points on a curve, and that no matter what the curve is, we can bring those two points together using the idea of a limit of getting closer and closer and closer. Not really getting where it's one point, but so close we can't tell the difference. Um, and uh, so now we are going to have an easier way to actually find derivatives. Uh, and then from here, we will learn a lot of different uh, different rules. Well, today we start learning different rules, but then we're, we're going to learn ways after the exam on, on some special ways to uh, find combinations of functions and those kind of things. So here we are section 2.3, and we'll notice where we've come, starting from 1.3, we've, we've come a long ways, we've had a review, so on Monday, we will have an exam review, so uh, if you let me know what questions you have in advance, we can get those set up, um, but get through that review, okay. So we're going to look at a few of the formal basic derivative rules. Uh, the derivative rules, which we have actually been developing as we use the uh, limit to find these derivatives. So the first one is that a constant has a derivative of zero. And the way we thought of this is, what is a constant? If you graph it, it's really just y equals that constant, say y equals 3. And if I graph what it, y equals 3, what we get is we get a horizontal line. There's y equals 3. Uh, and what kind of slope does a horizontal line have? It has a slope of 0 everywhere. So that's the idea of a constant has a derivative of 0, because its tangent line is 0 everywhere. Secondly, we've uh, approached this one that uh, every time we do take a derivative, we basically, the, the, the exponent behave, the, the function won't behave like a, an exponent with one less. So a uh, square root function that's a parabola will act like a linear. Uh, a cubic function, uh, their derivative will be a quadratic function, a parabola. So we, we so the method of doing this, and, and again, get the order right, the first step is to bring the exponent down to the end, the first thing I'm going to want to do is this. Oops. Well, whatever, because uh, I want to bring the derivative down. I lost my uh, little controller. Show the toolbar again. step is going to be to get our pin working again. Yeah, we'll just leave it there. First step is to take the exponent come down. The 
second step is once you've done that, then subtract one from the exponent. And especially if you're doing this mentally, if you don't do it in the right order, there's a tendency to subtract one first because that's actually kind of easier to do. And then you think, oh, bring it down, but you've brought down the wrong one. You've brought down the exponent minus one already. Um, so however it works for you, um, go through, you know, follow that. Now, this is a very sort of simple rule, but uh, we will see that it involves things like uh, radicals. So we might have x, a radical x. Um, we might have an index up here. What we're going to do to be able to apply this is we want to be able to rewrite radical functions as fractional exponents. So in this case, 1 over 2. Or if there was an uh, index here, say a 5, it would be 1 over 5. So that's one thing. The other thing is when we've got uh, exponents down here in the denominator, that's actually a negative exponent. Uh, so if it's, you know, it, sometimes we forget here because this is, we think this is x to, it doesn't have an exponent. Well, yes, it does. It's, it's got a, an invisible one. So whenever we go to take this, we want to rewrite these types, uh, a variable down in the denominator, as a negative exponent. And then we can use this rule of bring down the exponent. And again, if it's negative, it comes down negative. If it's a fraction, it comes down as a fraction. And then you subtract one from these exponents, right? And so if you've got a fractional exponent, just kind of remember what we're going to subtract is a fraction, right? 2 over 2 in this case. That's a, another way to write 1. Um, and the, the key part that I sort of messed up when I, I remember messing this up a lot is with negative exponents, when you're subtracting 1 from a negative exponent, it's actually getting larger, right? It's going to be negative 2. I mean, that's smaller, but in our minds we're thinking it went from 1 to 2. It went from negative 1 to negative 2 because that's how that happens. But just watch for those. Okay, so those that will take care of sort of our general power rule. Um, and then we put this sort of constant function thing together with uh, the um, power rule. And what we see is when we're multiplying a function by a constant, then we can take the derivative and just the, the constant just sort of, I say, tags along for the ride. So what that allows us to do is, is do something like uh, 5x to the third power. And what we're going to do is when we bring the exponent down, the exponent of 3, we're just going to take 3 times 5, right? So that 5 just kind of tags along for the ride. The 3 comes down, and then we subtract 1 from the exponent. And so we're going to get something like this, 15x squared. So that, that allows us to deal with uh, any type of single polynomial. Now, what about polynomials that have multiple terms? We've got a solution for that. Just thinking back to how we did uh, limits, right, uh, the rules for limits, we had a sum and difference rule. And basically, this, that, that's where this comes from. Because remember, all of these rules that we're talking about, getting the derivative, uh, comes from using limits. We could do it with limits. It's just it's kind of like a lot of work. Uh, so now we're getting some shortcut methods, basic methods. And so there's this nice one here where we just say, okay, if you're adding two functions, and again, what we can think of is, you know, uh, 3x to the fifth plus, uh, what, 7x squared. We could think of these as two different functions, right, f of x plus g of x, and so we can take their derivatives separately. Um, and what that's going to allow us to do in this case, again, just a quick example, Take the derivative of the first one, 5 times 3 is 15. Subtract 1 from the exponent, so that's 5 minus 1 is going to be x to the fourth. Since we're adding them, we just continue to add. And then we take the derivative of the second one, so 2 times 7 gives us 14. And then subtract 1 from the exponent, 2 minus 1 is 1. You could put a 1 there or you could leave it off, right, however you want to do it whatever's helpful to you. That's our answer. And the cool thing is with the difference rule, it's basically the same except instead of having addition, we've got subtraction. Okay. So a similar type thing would 
the only difference would be, you know, we'd have this thing with subtract 7x squared, so we'd have a subtraction here. So sum and difference rule allows us to take uh, derivatives term by term, nice, step by step. So we don't have to get any uh, fancy other rules for that. Um, and then I think we've got maybe uh, one more thing to look at. Oops, that wasn't supposed to show up all at once. Maybe I didn't do my... Um, I'll tell you what. Okay, so yeah, this last series is we, we also, in this course, will use trig functions because in engineering, trig functions are very valuable, uh, looking at um, anything with an angle in it. So first we'll look at what would the derivative of a sine function be. Now, you can look in the textbook. They will have ex uh, actual proofs of what these derivatives are using limits, walking you step by step. We've kind of done some of those things before. Um, and again, we'll take a very applied approach to this course. So um, I won't go through the proof here, but you're, again, you're welcome to take a look at that and uh, how it's done. So the way I'm going to approach this is, is taking a look more at the graphs. And remember that we're going to, uh, each place, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. So, we, you know, wherever we've got a maximum, we've, we've got that happening. We've got a minimum that's going to give us a derivative of zero. And then we can see um, along here we'll have a negative slope, right? So this is all going to be, what we're going to see is that um, from zero to zero, it's going to, this is all going to be underneath. This side is positive slope, so the zero here, zero there going up. And so instead of talking about it, let's just see what that graph would look like. So this is actually recreating the derivative graph from up here. So uh, this gives us a slope of zero. This gives us a slope of zero. So if you go from zero to zero, you've got to get there somehow. And this is telling us that all the y values, all the derivatives would be zero. So we get a slope like that. Slopes are going to be positive between those two points, so it's going to go up. The y values are positive. Now, now, remember over here, these are still positive y values, still positive slopes, but they're decreasing down to here. So then we identify, have I ever seen this graph before? Well, hopefully you recognize it as the cosine function. So the derivative of the sine function, right, this is a little derivative, a little prime. The derivative of the sine function is really just the cosine function. Again, not a full proof mathematically, it's in the text, but um, certainly the graphs, looking at what's happening with the graph. And I'll show you how to use the uh, TI calculate, TI-84 calculator to do this, as we're going to do the same thing with cosine. Okay, so if we come here, we could use Desmos, I'm, I'm going to try, uh, which I use for here. And again, what we'll think of is, um, you know, each time we have a maximum, that's going to be a zero slope. Let me change colors here. I think that'll be helpful. Okay, so uh, I'd have a zero slope here, a zero slope here. Um, the slopes along this portion are all going downward, so they're negative. So I would have something like this have a zero slope here, so it goes like that. These are all positive, so I would get a loop like that. And then back on this side, these are all positive slopes. This is a zero slope here, so about there. And then again, I got this loop going. So that's what, so the blue is the derivative function. The red one is uh, cosine. I didn't list it here, we'll, we'll list it in a little bit, but the red is is cosine. And so then we look at this graph, it's it's somewhat similar, but you know, it's not sine, because sine starts at zero and then goes up. It starts at zero, goes down. So this is a reflection over the x-axis, which means that the y's are changing. So um, what we see is that um, this derivative the derivative of the cosine function is going to be actually negative sine. And I'll show you, we'll do it actually with the graphing calculator. Okay. So uh, 
Let me do that now. We'll keep this stuff for now. Um, we'll come back. We'll see that that works. So how can I show this with a graphing calculator? Well, let's go to y equals. i got to remove all my hard work here. Uh, actually, I'm going to leave this here. This is going to give me the derivative. I'm going to turn this off. This is the second derivative. But again, yeah, so I don't have to delete my good work. I just turn it off. I'm going to turn off the second derivative, right? This is the derivative of the derivative. Actually, I'm going to turn off the derivative function as well because I don't want it to draw it quite yet. Um, it might be kind of confusing. But in y1, I'm just going to graph cosine. Where's that? There it is, cosine of x. And we'll, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to zoom. I'm going to do it. There is something called a Z, a zoom trig. makes it fit a little bit better for, for trigonometry. There's a nice little cosine function. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph, and I'm going to turn on the derivative graph. So this is going to take the, literally take the graph point by point and turn it into the derivative. So I put a little equals there. So now it's going to graph it. It will graph in black. Again, you can change colors if you want, and I'll show you. Now let's make it uh, blue. So I, let's see if I come here, and then I think I can. No, how do I change colors? I think I enter. Yeah, I enter, and then um, now I can scroll through the different types of colors. I want a green, no, green and navy. That's good, and then we can just enter. Now we're going to look at that graph. So this is on top of it. So the, the, the navy colored graph is going to be our derivative, just like we sort of hand drew in there. Um, so then to decide what is this, it's looking like some kind of a sine function. So we'll come back and we'll go and make y2, our red one now. Let's just make that sine function, sine of x. See what that looks like. Well, no, that's not on top of the blue one. But watch, if we put a negative in front of that, this red is going to go down to the bottom, and this red from the bottom is going to go to the top. So we'll see that, and again, second insert, second insert, and I put in a negative in front. And then remember, this kind of negative, not a subtraction. Because we're not subtracting anything, we're just putting a negative there. And then when I graph it, watch this. There's Did it in, that's right, y3 comes here. So the red is on top of the blue. So now I see this blue, the derivative of the cosine is actually the negative sine function. Um, again, do we have to prove all this? Not necessarily. We just need to be able to use it. But sometimes when we see, you know, when we convince ourselves that that actually is, instead of saying, well, it is because it is, um, well, it is because we saw it, right? And so we're going to see that right there. We'll come back to our presentation, and there's all that stuff. And then, so when I take the derivative of cosine, I get negative sine x. So you just have to remember cosine is a negative one. Sine is just cosine. Um, and again, those are two that I will mix up. I know one's negative, but which one's the negative one? Um, well, now you've got a way using your graphing calculator to kind of take a look at it, right? If you forget, you can do a quick graph take the derivative graph and say, okay, this is that one. Okay. And that's for this uh, section, that's basically all we need to know. We are now ready to start practicing on taking a few uh, derivatives. Okay, so uh, rather than looking at just sort of the simple cases, which we did while we were making the, um, introducing the basic rules, what we're going to do is we'll take some that are a little bit more complicated. So what we want to see is that this is, uh, again, we want to think of this being in terms of a radical. Uh, stick with red seems to stand out. So what we want to think of this is, is the square root of 1 half, right? Or, sorry, it's x to the 1 half. Square root is 1 half. So um, what I'm going to do, I guess I'll write it out. Yeah, so for, I'm going to distribute it, the division, to make these each individual terms, right? This is x to the 1 half uh, plus which 
12 X and I'm going to put that exponent up there X to the one half uh, and then plus 19 which is just a constant right X to the one half so what happens to each so now these are separate terms we can take the derivative of this all uh, and you'll see sometimes in the note in the uh, text they use this uh, D dx to indicate that they want the derivative. Sometimes they'll use this little um, prime, f prime, uh, to indicate the derivative. So two different methods because um, calculus was credited to two different individuals, um, Leibniz and um, the British guy, uh, Newton. Um, and they, they use different notations, so that's how it is. So the other thing we want to do is, okay, we've got this fraction. We want to simplify. So that's going to be x squared. And then again, this is a negative exponent, so it's 2 minus 1 half. So I'll write that for x, 2 minus 1 half, uh, common denominators, all that kind of stuff. So uh, sometimes that's the hardest part is remembering how to work with fractions. Um, 1 minus 1 half. And as we'll see later when we do uh, some of the trig stuff, uh, it's remembering some of the trig um, details, uh, values, and stuff that we probably memorized at one point, but maybe by now have forgotten. So 2 minus 1 half, that's going to be 1 and a half, or as a fractional exponent, that'll be, right, 2 is like 4 halves minus 1, so we're going to get 3 halves. Uh, 1 minus 1 half, that's going to be 12x to the 1 half. And we haven't done anything, we really have not taken the derivative yet. Uh, we're just getting, oops, not 12.
they might choose one or the other way. You just have to be able to identify what is what. So this is still negative. We've got 19 halves, and this x being negative is going to go into the denominator. So we've got 19 over 2. Now, 3 halves uh, can be written. Notice it, there's a 2 halves. That's a full, uh, you know, 2 over 2 equals 1. So there's a full x out here, or an x that's not inside the square root, and the square root of x. So there's a 1 here. This would be a 1 half. Um, and, and that's how we can rewrite 3 halves. Okay. So this would be our final A way of doing it. And again, um, just figure out, you know, it, uh, the system might, have, might accept this as an answer. And sometimes it's easier to write it that way because then you don't make any other mistakes as you go through. Okay, so that's finding the derivative of that one. Um, we're going to take a few more, and, and again, we'll look at the ones that involve a little bit more detail, getting fractional exponents and combining things. Okay, so, well, I didn't even have the question then, so the question was then what is, you know, find the derivative. That's what all these questions are. Okay, so this first one is going to be 7x to the 4th, x to the 1 half. And what you have to remember is when you are multiplying with exponents, you add the exponents. So this is going to become 7. Uh, so when I add these exponents, I need a common denominator. So 4 is going to become, I'm going to rewrite that as 8 halves, right? So it has a common denominator. We add it together, that's going to be 9 halves. Second term, we've got a negative 2. These are all negative exponents, so maybe I'll, I'll work it out first. Same type of thing. This is going to be 4 halves plus 1 half. So this becomes x to the 5 halves. It's in the denominator, so I'm going to move it upstairs. And this is a plus and a minus, so it's, you know, I don't like to have too many different signs. Here's a 2. When I move it upstairs, the 5 halves becomes a negative. That's kind of what you want to do each time, is you want to have your exponents up there uh, on the line, and then we just apply our basic principle, our basic, um, our basic power rule. We take the exponent, multiply it by the coefficient. 9 times 7 is 70. 72 or 73, 72, 70, I forgot what 9 times 7 is. <laughs> this happens at times, so uh, I think it's 72, 9 times 7, that's 63, where am I, oh, I'm thinking of 8, okay, See, that's what my problem, so 63, sometimes these are the things as we go along, and um, it's okay to check it out, because we're thinking high-level high thinking, right? Um, we, we forget that 9 times 7 is 63. So I had the 3 part in there and messed it up with the 8. Anyway, and then we, again, subtract 1, which I always think of as 2 over 2. So 9 minus 2 is going to give me 7 halves. For this one, again, we bring the exponent down. So we got a negative times a negative. That's going to change our sign. And then 5 times 2 is 10, divided by 2 is 5. Or divide by 2 first, and then you just got 5 left. And then the exponent, remember, we're going to subtract 2 over 2. And this is another reason why you want to make sure you're, you move your exponent up, is um, otherwise you go the wrong direction. A negative minus another negative, this is going to give us negative 7 halves. So it actually goes up. And again, we want to make it pretty, so we come down here and we say, well, what's the real derivative? It's equal to 63. 7 halves, uh, so I 
I, I kind of uh, make it an, into a mixed number. Seven goes into six three times, so I'm going to get x to the third with a half left over, and that's going to be my square root of x. Okay, so I broke down the seven halves. I'm thinking of it as six halves, which is three, plus one half, which is a square root, right? So this is, becomes three, and this becomes a radical. That's how it, so there's, and I, I'm just dealing with the exponents. I do the same thing here. I get five, but that's going to be in the top because I've got a negative exponent in the denominator. The same deal as seven halves is going to be x to the third uh, square root of x. And you'll kind of see is, you know, the denominator's exponents actually got bigger, didn't they? The numerators, those that were up here because they were positive, were subtracting one, actually got smaller. So, uh, and again, we're remembering that the denominator is actually negative, so it, it became more negative. But when we just look at this, uh, you know, we see uh, there's a 3 and there's a 3. This one, it looks like the, the, the denominator got bigger, and that's what will happen. With uh, that's what will happen with uh, negative exponents. Okay. So um, we want both the first and second derivatives of this function. So again, just more practice with it, and what we'll see is that sine and cosine kind of go in circles because derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is remember negative sine. Um, so cosine will be a little different. You'll see the the signs will change back and forth as we go through this. So. We'll just kind of go with the first derivative. So the derivative of sine is cosine. Remember, this 4 is just like a common multiplier, so it's 4 cosine of x. And then we do it term by term. This 9 is a constant multiplier. It just tags along for the ride. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. Um, yeah, we were just a little too fast there. Come on, get out of there. Um, so we don't want it positive, we want it negative, and we're going to make that sine of x. This is our first derivative, there's that answer. Second derivative, which is the derivative of the derivative. And we come up here, so 4 tags along for the ride. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Negative. Derivative of sine is positive cosine, so the negative stays negative. So we see we're, we're almost back to what we started with, but not quite. Our signs are different. We'd have to kind of go through a few uh, a few iterations. We'd probably get back eventually, and that's kind of like uh, that's that's how trig functions are. They go in circles, right? So that's uh, that's how we do trig functions. Now, this is the one where uh, I'm going to spend a little time reminding you about value, trig values. Okay, so pi over 6 is one of the special angles we have. Um, we want the equation of the tangent line. So uh, this one, to get the right answer, you're going to have some uh, of those exact answers in there. So using the calculator would, would give you um, decimal answers, approximates, and so it's not going to quite work. So we're going to go through this. So the equation of the tangent line to this curve, uh, so what they're saying is the tangent line, remember, is the slope, at least the slope of the tangent line, comes from the derivative of the function. So first thing we want to, well, I don't know first thing, but anyway, one thing we want to do is what is the derivative of y? So we'll do that, remember, just kind of like we did last time. Derivative of sine is cosine, so it's going to be 6 cosine x. Okay, so that's what we're going to use in, uh, to get us the slope. The slope of the tangent line is going to be equal to this function at pi over 6. So what I need to do is I need to find 6 times cosine making up my own functions as I go. 
six times cosine of pi over six. Um, now, what is pi over six? Uh, it's either one half or square root of three over two. And I, you know, do you remember? I'm not sure. So what I do is let me show you. If you can count from one, two, three, you can do trig. So I'm going to do a, a first quadrant of the unit circle. And hopefully this will help you remember it. And then the other quadrants, all that changes is the whether the coordinate, the x and y coordinates are um, positive or negative. Okay. We'll see how all this turns out. I, uh, this thing keeps um, pausing on me. So anyway, this first point here is going to be, um, you know, the important point of zero, zero, or zero degrees. And x is 1, y is 0. The other important one is 90 degrees, or pi over 2 is up here. y is 1, but x is 0. So this is 0, 1. So those are the two extremes. We're um, listed in radians because that's what we usually will use a lot. And this is uh, 0 radians. And then there's these three angles here, so 30 degrees. 45 degrees and 60 degrees, or in radians, pi over 6, pi over 4, and pi over 3. Now, what you notice is that the x coordinates, which are associated with the cosine, cosine comes from the x coordinate. Uh, are large, they're going from 1 to 0. So they start out large and they get smaller. Um, so what is the larger number? So I need to count from 3. So I do 3, 2, 1. Uh, each of these are half of a semicircle. Maybe that's the way I remember it. So I have to divide them each by 2. And then the other part is uh, this involves the Pythagorean theorem because uh, they're triangles, right? So then you just remember that each of these has a square root on it. And I could do square root of 1, but square root of 1 is 1, so it goes away. But just think of it, that's how we do it. So those are the x-coordinates. And again, I'm spending a little bit of time to help those who need some way to remember uh, how to get these special angles. Uh, the y coordinates go in the opposite direction. They go from small to large, right? So they go from 0 to 1. So then we count 1, 2, 3. And again, we go through the same thing. This is half of a semicircle, half of a half of a circle. So they all get divided in half. Uh, there might be another explanation for it, but it, again, all I'm working in is some way to remember how to get these. And then these are really coming from triangles, which use a Pythagorean theorem. It has a square in there, so I take a square root of everything. And what I've just done is I've recreated the unit circle, at least in the first quadrant. In the other angles, the other quadrants, you just change whether they're, the coordinate is uh, positive or negative. Uh, but all of that work was done so that I could see that cosine of pi over 6 right, is going to be square root of 3 over 2. So this becomes equal to 6 times square root of 3 over 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3, so that's 3 square root of 3 for that value. That's our slope. Okay. Um, and so our tangent line, again, we're doing all this by hand because, you know, they're going to want this exact answer. Uh, it's going to be y equals mx. So what's our m? It's... Uh, 3 square root of 3 times x uh, plus b. To find out what b is, then that's where we come back and we have to plug a point in. And so we plug in x coordinate of pi over 6, a y coordinate of 3. Um, so y is going to be 3. So we get 3 square root of 3. 
how this all comes out. Let me know if this is, um, yeah, if you've watched this and I if we've got some um, pauses in there, let me know. Um, I'll take a look after I'm done, but uh, times this plus B. So uh, three and six, so I got the three over there. So this three goes into the six, and there's going to be a two down here, right? Um, so it's three equals. I like to put uh, any numbers or stuff in front of the square roots. So I'm going to put pi square root of three over two plus b. Um, you, sometimes in, uh, in the answer I show, you know, and they'll put it over here, but um, you run the risk of it forgetting this little line and actually having it inside the square root. Pi is not inside the square root. So then we subtract this from both sides, right? We're solving for b, so subtract this. We're going to get that b is 3 minus pi square root of 3 over 2. That's what b is. And so what do we write for our final equation? It's going to be y equals 3 square root of 3. plus I'll put a parenthesis here 3 minus pi square root of 3 over 2 so there's our b there's our slope I think we got all that right yeah square root of 3 over 2 that should be that um, and that's our equation for the tangent line It was easier to take the derivative this time because we just had to remember well, derivative of sine is cosine. This one, finding all the, the special values and everything, that's where the, the complication was in this one. It was really the, probably you know the trick part. All right, um, where are we? So we've got these uh, these rules for taking derivatives. Uh, remember the constant multiplier rules. It just that tags along the power rule to bring the exponent down, multiply it by the coefficient, and then subtract one from the exponent. Uh, we have a sum and difference rule, so we can take uh, term by term, we can take the derivative, and then remember your trig rules. At this point, we only have two. The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So remember those. And as we go forward, we'll build the rest of the trig rules from just those two. Um, Radicals are fractional exponents, so remember that's some of the difficulties is learning how to work with the fractional exponents. Uh, rational um, denominators, those are negative exponents, so bring them up and treat them with the negatives and, and make sure you're getting your signs right. Uh, and then we had in here a little bit about uh, the special trig angles. Those are going to come throughout this course, uh, and sometimes that's you know, the hardest part, you're going to know how to take the derivative, you're going to know how to do all the calculus, but then you forget, well, what's the cosine of pi over 6? Uh, so at least know how to, to get to that one way or another. So keep moving forward. There's 30 questions this time, but again, we've got these simplified rules that should make getting the derivative much easier than using the limit definitions that we've been working with. Uh, over the weekend, uh, get ready for the exam that we're going to have next Wednesday. For Monday, we will have a full review. We can answer any questions that you have at that time. So do get caught up on whatever homework you haven't done yet, and uh, keep making progress in reviewing for the exam.